My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. And today, we have a very, very, I love this episode. I'm, I'm pumped for this episode. It is about building power through habit. And my guest today is the great Michael Cherno. He is the founder of Seymour's, co-founder of The Meatball Shop, and co-founder of Well Well. And the, this guy, he is basically the modern-day renaissance man, also known as the FOMO Sapiens, by the way. He's a restaurateur, entrepreneur, TV host, fitness personality. His Instagram makes me feel not very fit. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, crazy. And family man dedicated to inspiring the world through positivity, hospitality, and service. And he has a new podcast called Creatures of Habit. That's Creatures with a K, which is all about making better, healthier habits, which I really like because, you know, I'm not one of these New Year's resolution people, as you well know, but habits are good. Habits, they help us. And so what we're going to talk about today, first of all, is you know, Michael is a guy who does a bunch of different things. So it's just interesting to hear his perspective. He's kind of just one of these trend spotters. And I love people like that because I feel like they're always teaching me something new and teaching us something new. So we're just going to get a lot of just information, which I really enjoyed just hearing what he had to say. He's plugged in. Number two, we're going to talk about fear because he wrote this great piece that I read as I was prepping for the interview about how fear has driven his decision making. And so we get right into it. And he talks about a really tricky time of his life where he was an addict and how he overcame that and has become such a powerful force in his industry. So it's a really good story there. And he's very, I don't know, he's very, I just kind to share it with us because it's not the kind of thing people, you know, yell from the rooftops, right? We also talk about creatures of habit and about how he uses habits to get more done. And so I've been implementing some of the things I've been trying to anyway. He has this whole sleep thing that we talk about, which I've been trying to do imperfectly. But Michael, I don't know. I listen to the guy and then I implement what he says, which tells me that he's pretty, pretty powerful because, you know, I don't listen to everybody. <laughs> I listen to him. All right. The small ass today share this episode. People love Michael. I've been telling friends around New York and people know who this guy is. And I didn't know him actually. So I'll confess that I knew his restaurants. I didn't know him as a person, but people do. They like him. So share this with somebody who you think would like Michael's message or who already likes him. A lot of people do. And then tell them to listen to the show. Okay. That is my small ask. And now on to the interview. As you know, I like to start every interview with the same question. And so I started my conversation with Michael with this. What's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? The short answer is a decision I made when I was 23 years old to get sober. That was a, that 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 was a probably the most pivotal moment in my life and everything I have today outside of some shitty tattoos <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. were made on the other side of that decision and have helped me build the life that I am super grateful to have. That's a great start. And and we're going to get into that um, in this interview today. But I, I want to start with a, with, I want to ask you a question. So <laughs> see if you remember this. Do you remember what you were doing the week of October 21st, 2014? Any memories? October 21st, 2014. Chances are I was in the raw space of well mm, either shooting the tv show with cnbc called uh what the hell is the name of that show oh my <laughs> consumed the real restaurant business okay. uh, i was i was I, I was that was like probably around the time that i was shooting that show or i was in the early no, I was I was like it's still heavily involved in meatball shop, starting to do starting to create Seymour's and shooting that TV show. 
Okay, so that's all good. There's one thing I'll, I'll jog your memory a little bit. One thing you were probably doing was dealing with the fact that somebody had eaten at your restaurant that had tested positive for Ebola. Oh my god! Remember that? Remember that? No, 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 no. Do yeah, I sorry, sorry that? to do that to you, but this is when I when I was prepping for this interview. I because I you know so meatball shop. If you come to New York City, you probably eaten at it. It's delicious and wonderful. And I don't even like meat that much. And I used to go there, and I lived less than a 10 minute walk from this restaurant. And I was like, wow, the Ebola crisis has come to the hood. And so they shut down the restaurant and then Mayor de Blasio, who, you know, not everybody's favorite, did a solid and ate at the restaurant and you guys reopened. But what was that like? Because that was crazy. By the way, so I just want to mention something about that. I got a call at 11 o'clock at night from the, I think it was the DEC. And they said, are you Michael Chernow? founder of meatball shop. And I said, yes, who is this? <laughs> and they said, um, somebody who tested positive for Ebola was at your restaurant within the last 24 hours. And we need to quarantine your restaurant. And I called on my partner, Daniel, and he's like, I just got off the phone. And so we all, obviously I was upstate at my, at our house. And we, you know, I drove down in the city and not only did de Blasio eat there, de, ba de Blasio also had his press conference right in front of our restaurant. So <laughs> that was the city really coming to the rescue for a, what could have been an, an incredibly challenging experience. Obviously, it was very, I mean, it was, a, it was tough no matter how you slice it. But uh, de Blasio did us a big solid for sure by doing the eating there and then, uh, you know, doing his press conference and then following up by eating. But, but also the amount of people that came out to support us and line up to eat at the restaurant was, was like truly touching. It was beyond, I mean, Daniel and I were like, wow, like this is, this is New York city at its finest, you know? Yeah, it's so true. And, and that's, that's really cool. Cause it kind of shows us where you, where you've gone, you've built, brands and experiences that people really care about. Now, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the interview that you made this important decision to become sober. And I was reading up on you and you wrote something that I thought, you know, I imagine plays into a, a lot of this journey in your life. You wrote in, in a, on a website called Local Optimist uh, that, quote, from as early as I can remember, fear played a big role in my decision-making process. So talk about why that is and how that sort of shaped your early years up until that moment when you made the decision to put your life back together. Well, I think to kick off the sort of premise of that, that quote, fear still plays a big part in my decision-making process. However, there's two ways to experience fear in my like from my standpoint, you can live in fear and truly struggle all the time because fear is present in everyone's life. There's no way around it. Or you can live with fear right next to you <laughs> where you put your arm around fear. You look at it, you appreciate it, you understand that it's there and you embrace it. And before that day of August 2nd, 2004, when I was 23 years old and decided to just change everything, I lived in fear and fear controlled my life. Fear really had its grips around me. And I ultimately did everything in my power to hide from it, run from it, escape it. And when I made that decision, I had to face fear head on and understood that the beauty of fear is that it's ever present for everyone. And on the other side of fear is always freedom. It just is. Freedom is a fear is a doorway to success and freedom. And the only way to experience that is to run towards it full speed. That's my experience. And so Fear certainly plays a role in my life today. Fear certainly plays a role in my decision-making process, except today I never run away from it. I always look for it and run towards it. And I think that is the catalyst to a lot of the success that I've been able to build in my life. 
is that I absolutely use fear as motivation, as fire to fuel my engine. And so, you know, <laughs> fear can either be there for a very long time, or if you run at it hard, hard and fast, it's there for a little bit of time. And so I like spurts of fear as opposed to long drawn out soliloquies of fear. How'd you flip the switch? Like, you know, we've had people on the show before who, you know, one of my guests recently was, was paralyzed. He had an accident. He's quadriplegic for two months and has recovered mobility. And so like his whole, he's like a whole different person. That was his moment, right? Like for you, it, it, that, that changing a mindset. I mean, everybody wants to change their mindset. That's why everybody's doing, you know, micro dosing psychedelics nowadays. It's like everybody wants, I think, to reset. And I think we all became more fearful, especially during the pandemic. But like, it's really hard to flip that switch. Like, what was that process for you? I was brought down. I was brought to my knees. Really, I was at the end of my rope. It was a decision I needed to make or I was going to die. And sometimes I think that's what it takes for people to have an enlightening experience. Uh, 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 you know, for me, it was everybody that I loved and cared about, I pushed away. And they were for years telling me that I had so much to offer. But there was this thing that was standing in my way and that thing was me. I just didn't know it. All I had to do was like have self-awareness and be, be aware enough to understand that like there's no one else. There was no one else to blame for my problem. There was no one else to um, look to for the answer. It was it was all it was an inside job that I needed to uncover. And I think another thing that's been super sort of eye opening for me in my career is the driving force. Ultimately, I love connecting with human beings. I think that is really my superpower. But mm -hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily what drives me. I think what drives me, and since, since I was a little kid, has been my sort of ferocious hunger for discovery. I'm like a very curious person. Curiosity is like at the core of my daily philosophy in life. And it manifests in a many, in many different ways, right? Like you, you, you said early on that, like, it's being able to do a bunch of different things and kind of creating the life that you want to live as opposed to living a life that, you know, people have potentially established or, or believed to be the way to live your life, right? But I enjoy doing a bunch of different things. And that my curiosity has led me into being passionate about fitness and nutrition. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I really am, I'm a believer in, you know, being at the top of my totem pole with my health. And, but I also am insanely curious about business, insanely curious about lifestyle in general. Like I really do love lifestyle, how people live their lives and how I can be an asset for other people in that, in that journey. Um, but I'm passionate about my family. I mean, you know, like, I've, I've got all these these pillars and I'm driven to drive hard or I should say I'm driven to drive hard. I, I, I drive hard in all those areas because I really do wake up every day wanting to discover, you know, one of my one of the one of my favorite pastimes to do with my kids, especially now that we live in upstate New York, like in rural New York, is we go out on Saturday and Sunday morning, specifically in the spring, summer and fall. And we walk into the woods and we just lift up rocks and logs for hours we walk through the woods mm -hmm. we lift up rocks we lift up logs and we try to find critters that live under there you know and it's like really it's like a treasure hunt with my boys but for me there's this i'm i'm so excited about just lifting up rocks and it's a metaphor for my life i love to wake up every day and lift up rocks you know and sometimes there's cobras <laughs> and either i'm going to let it bite me or i'm going to grab it faster than it can get me um or, you know, and sometimes there's like a, you know, spotted salamander and I'm like, oh, hey, little buddy, you know. And so I do really I do really believe that curiosity is what uh, is what drives me on a daily basis. FOMO. FOMO. There's a lot in here. Right. And I think about, you know, fear of missing out. The first word is fear in FOMO. Right. And so fear drives this this behavior. But 
fear is an incredible motivator. And so many of the people who listen to the show, myself included, like I wake up every, every day like a sponge. And I grew up in, in the middle of the woods. So I understand what it was. We did that every day. We were out there turning over rocks, building forts, whatever. We had like a whole military operation as children, which by the way, you know, it's like now I'm looking back and I'm like, hmm, was that good or bad? But but uh, but it is that curiosity, I think, is what drives so many of us. And the system for a lot of us beats it out of us, like going to these schools and all the structured things in the job where you're, you know, put in a box, like those things beat out our curiosity. And it's our job to fight to keep it alive, even if we're not entrepreneurs, even if we don't work for ourselves. Now, on the flip side of that, though, so you're, you're what I like about your your story, and it's, I find it so exciting is, you know, you started out. In, in the world of food and you worked at restaurants, you started your own restaurants, you've moved on to media and fitness. Now you've kind of, you're in, you've got your hands on a lot of pots. I'm curious, was it always that you were doing a lot of things or like when you first started in the food industry, did you have to do, you know, you think about like, you know, the classical, like Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours or whatever it is, but like, did you have to become a specialist in order to get the expertise that you could then spread your wings? Or were you always somebody who was doing a bunch of different things? You know, I, if I had to describe sort of the way I see it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like a fear facing, relatively confident life liver. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't conform to the idea that you have to do one thing and do it very well. And that's where you, that's where you stay. When I was just working in restaurants, you know, growing up in New York city, I was, I grew up in Manhattan in the public school system. There was lots of kids, New York city, you know, now, but like specifically in like the, the nineties, you know, was, was sort of like this, it was, it was the Mecca of, of modern culture, you know, especially in the United States of America. It was just like for everything from, from fashion to the arts, to, uh, food, um, you know, it was just, it was just like, it, it, it was the, the nineties were like, it was like a real sort of like unearthing of 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 culture in the world right between the music that was coming out and the fashion that that started to take shape and you know hip-hop culture and and so i was exposed to all this like in a polarized way right in the middle of of it all right like i was a skateboarder at astor place you know there it was just that that's that was like and i wanted a lot of that cool stuff and so I, and my parents didn't have a lot of money. So in order to get that cool stuff, I had to work. And so not only was I exposed to all this cool stuff, but now I'm exposed to communicating with people at scale, right? I was like, I got a job in a restaurant when I was 12. So I, I really not only learned how to be a chameleon because I was always the youngest guy, always the youngest kid in the environment, but I you know, I, I sort of understood like today, you know, I, I feel very confident, like at the white house or on skid row, you put me in both places. I am going to make friends with everybody I meet, you know, just because of how I grew up in New York city. And so I think that like between that and then, you know, and then working in the nightlife for years and then making the decision to get sober and then replacing all of my bad habits with great ones introduced me to a whole new chapter of life in the world of fitness and nutrition. And so I never, even though I opened up the meatball shop, which was do one thing, do it really well, we focused on meatballs. Everything else in my life was kind of, it, it was, there was a lot of variety. I was, I was into fitness. I was into food and beverage. I was into fashion and lifestyle. I got married pretty young for my for New York City, so I really was was passionate about family, and so, you know, like I kind of like break my life into like family, fitness, fashion, food, and faith. Those are like the things that I love. Lots of F's there, but I, I, like I I'm I'm down to just pursue all of those things as hard as I can. 
And I've been successful at that. You know, um, I, I launched a business a year, a little over a year, year and change ago called Creatures of Habit, which I've, I've, I've taken a, a break from the restaurant business after 27 years and uh, and started this lifestyle and wellness brand called Creatures of Habit. It's a direct to consumer CPG company. We sell we sell a product called Meal One, which is an instant and overnight oatmeal blend with all sorts of great supplements, super clean ingredients. And like I've just learned in the last year and a half, a whole new business, like going from the restaurant industry to digital media and, and, and product is like a totally different business. But I surrounded myself with great people. I used the skill sets that I've developed over the years to surround myself with great people in a totally new industry that are experts in this industry. And I've used my platform um, to launch another business and it's working. It's working. Knock on wood, you know, it's working. And so I guess that's that, 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 that is to say that anybody that's listening, there's no pill you can take. There's no switch you can flip. There's no person that can save you. You know, it's, it, 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 it is really decision after decision that shows up in your life on a daily basis, you have a choice. The right one or the left one. Hmm. <laughs> you know, hmm. that's the way I see it. You got it's two two ways to go. You you got the right decision, which most of us know what the right decision is at the time, whether you choose to make it is up to you. You push snooze or you wake up. You eat the donut or you eat the apple. You Work the extra hour because you know that you want the promotion and you, even though you may not want to sit at the desk the extra hour, but you know that your manager is across the room and they will notice if you do it or you go home. They're, the decisions are just, they're, they're nonstop, you know? And so it's hard work no matter how you slice it, but the more right decisions you make over time, they compound. And now I could say after years and years and years of, of really hustling hard, I'm very comfortable working six to eight hours a day. Comfortable, not don't feel guilty. Like show up to my office at, at 1115 and leave at six and feel totally OK by that because I put in the work. Like, I, I, I believe that that at, at a certain point, there is a balance to life. You know, there's like there's this for, for years. It was like hustle, 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 hustle culture. Got to work 18 hours a day. I don't believe in that shit. I think that there is a time and a place for it without a question of a doubt. I know for sure the first few years, first two to three years launching Meatball Shop, my business partner, Daniel and I, we did work 90 hours a week. I almost lost my marriage. Um, and. There were, I had so much stress that my hands and my feet were so swollen because stress had totally like, and it wasn't even stress about like the business, you know, suffering or not. It was just that amount of work and, and not balanced out with any personal time mm -hmm. is suffering for the human condition, like truly not we're not built for it. We need to be able to take, take a break and not be, not have cortisol f firing all the time, you know? And it took me years to understand that, but now I know. And so when I started to walk the path of like, okay, you know, maybe I don't need to work 14 to 18 hours a day. Maybe I should take the weekends off. Then only did I realize that like by doing that, I was far more efficient at work, far more efficient got so much more shit done by living that than working the 18 hours or 15 hours or whatever it was, you know. FOMO. FOMO. What I, what I'm wondering here is like, so you're clearly somebody it, it, like you think about the unhealthy things that people do, whether it's, you know, partying all the time, you know, drugs, abusing food, whatever we all, everybody has something like I know very few people who don't have one or two vices and some of those people then lose control. And what they forget is like, it's hard work to maintain a negative habit that is hurting you. 
It physically is exhausting. It takes time and money. It, it consumes your life. And if you cut that thing out, you open up tons of time to work on things that are actually going to serve you a lot better. And it's not easy to do, and it's a whole process, but the things that can make you, I mean, th these little changes that you talk about every day, am I going to have the donut or the apple? Well, if you have the apple, chances are by the end of the week, you're going to like the apple better, but it is that process of being curious and trying that thing and saying, how am I going to feel when I do this, right? So it's all that stuff wrapped up. But I wonder, like, you know, given the fact creatures of habit, I know you, you've got, you know, the, the, the overnight oatmeal, which by the way, I love overnight oatmeal. So I'm going to try that. Um, and you've got a podcast out as well, exploring habit. And I'm curious, like, as you've done, now you've been talking to people, you know, we're in a new year, everybody, you know, is, is thinking about what they want to do. Um, and you know, we, we've all kind of come out of a couple of years of tough times. And so I, I feel like everybody's chomping at the bit to do the things, to build the things, to experience life. But at the same time, I think people have realized like hustle culture is BS. It's not, you know, all that stuff, it just doesn't serve us. And so it's, that's a marketing job. And, you know, at some point or another, you wake up and you're like, okay, I'm working all the time and for what? And, you know, maybe you make it to the top of the mountain, but then you look around, there's nothing there. So there has to be balance. So what have you learned? Like, what are the couple of things that you can share with the audience about, you know, either in, in your own personal work or doing the podcast that, that you've learned about, you know, building habits that actually really get you to where you need to be? Yeah, I, I'm, I am. My mission right now, as we sit here personally and professionally, is to highlight habit and try my very best to convince as many people as possible that if you are not the priority in your life, you're making a mistake. That's not to say that my wife and kids aren't everything to me because they are my wife and kids are everything, but I am the priority and I know that and I don't sacrifice time with them, but I put myself first always. And that means that I wake up an hour and 30 minutes before they do so that I can take all the time I need to make myself the priority in my life uh, on a daily basis. And so when anybody's asking me about like, and this has been a common thread uh, throughout the Creatures of Habit podcast as well, I would say, I don't have the exact number, but well over 50% of the people I've interviewed are early risers. They wake up very early. They start their day early. Like how early are we talking about? 5 a.m. On, oh, on, on, a, on, on a regular basis. <sighs> and, you know, I would say some, somewhere between 5 and 6 a.m. And I think, you know, for me, I am a 4.45 to 5 a.m. riser every day. And, and here's why. I have earned, I used to wake up at like 6.30 and then we moved upstate and I had a little bit more time to set my set up, set my environment up um, because, you know, we lived in a smaller apartment, you know, up here I have like a lot of setup um, that I'm like stoked about. But I, I, I realized that if I woke up an hour earlier every day, I just earned the most valuable asset in life which is time. I just earned 365 extra hours a year, 365 hours straight without no sleep, 365 hours. If I woke up an hour earlier every day, that's 15 straight days of productive time. Because typically when you wake up in the morning, you're firing, right? Like you're, that is like a very like productive time for a lot of people. You wake up mm. now, if you wake up and you're, you know, you're late, like that's not a fun time. It's a pretty, pretty stressful time, but I never wake up with that stress because I have gotten into the habit of waking up earlier. So my morning routine is very extensive. Um, I would say that, uh, personal self-care, self-love habits tend to be what, what a lot of people talk about on the podcast. 
um, far more than, you know, business habits per se. I think we are coming into a time after a pretty intense, like you said, you know, three years where people are really starting to understand that personal care and our health is paramount. So important. And it doesn't matter about anything else when you're struggling for your life with your health, right? Like the, the, the saying, like, it really sucks to have to worry about your health. So get ahead of it. You know, like be mindful of your health on a regular basis. So you don't have to worry about it when it's too late. And I think that that is, you know, become a trend for that, you know, well, it's no, it's no, it's no surprise, right? Wellness has taken a whole new, is, is, is like a whole thing, right? Like wellness, the word wellness itself used to be like this premium term, right? Like wellness, it was like rich people live in yes. this wellness space. And now I think wellness is far broader than it was pre pandemic, <laughs> you know, people spent a lot of time at home and they were given an opportunity to try meditation, try journaling, try breath work, Wim Hof. How many people do you know started doing Wim Hof in the pandemic, you know, totally. it, like Wim Hof breathing. Um, so what I say, you know, to, to people that are trying to walk the journey or trying to step onto the path of wellness is only in the last 200 years or so have co homes, cars, toys, gadgets, expensive things become the goal. Before that, it was food and shelter and survival, mm -hmm. strength and food, right? Like you won when you got the, the meal, when you hunted the animal or when you harvested the fruit. You won when you when you got away from like the saber tooth tiger. Like that was the win. That was the that was it. You won. You you were able to fight it off, or you were able to to defend yourself in some way, shape, or form. That was we are wired to believe that survival and 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 food are like massive wins. And so I'm trying to reinterpret that in my life where. I want to win through physical fitness and I want to win through the things that I feed my body. And if I can commit to doing those two things, well, I can do anything because those genuinely feel like wins for me. So I make sure that I physically move my body in a vigorous way every single day. So I feel exhausted at that moment. And it's a real win. Like I genuinely feel like I've won. I've won mm. every day. It's something I control. I can control a win. There's nothing better than being able to control a win, right? And then the food that I put into my body, I want it to nourish me. I don't want to feel bad after I ate it. You know, I want to be able to like work my way to those treats. Of course, I fucking eat a donut when I want to, but 90%, 80, 90% of the time, I'm eating really healthy. And I'm 42 years old, but I feel like I'm like 25. And my blood work kind of, reads 25 year old guy, you know, and that's yeah. because I really do put my, put my health and my wellness, uh, 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 before my business and most other things in my life, you know, and my, and my wife knows this, right? Like she, she, she knows, like if I've said it on a pod on many podcasts, we're like, I am the priority in my life. And, and because of that, I show up as a much better husband, a much more loving and, 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 and patient father a better business owner, a better business partner, friend, brother, son, you know, uncle, all of it. When I feel well, I show up into the world well er. <laughs> and uh, and so that's what I would say. So if anybody's thinking about trying to step in, what I would tell you to do is start by waking up an hour earlier. But that's a great step. You know, I think a that's lot of a great people step. fail when they're like, Yeah. That's a that's so tangible. And you know the thing it makes me think of this quote it's been attributed to like everybody under the sun, but the quote is, you know, a healthy man has a million dreams. A sick man has one. So everybody, I want you to head over. 
and check out, first of all, if you want to learn more about Michael, go to michaelchurnow.com. You can also find him on Instagram, Michael Chernow. Check out Creatures of Habit. That's Creatures with a K, both on Instagram and the website. Michael Chernow, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, man. Oh, perfect. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.